Welcome to Attached, a podcast about the loved ones we're attached to and the good, the bad, and the ugly advice about those relationships that maybe we shouldn't be so attached to. We here at Attached want to share ways to enhance your relationships and debunk all of that bad relationship advice using science. Science. Oh, that was beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Dr. Patricia Robertson out of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, the College of Nursing. I'm Dr. Jacob Priest from the University of Iowa College of Education. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm Dr. Sarah Woods at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Today, Jacob is going to bring us something fun and uplifting and pop and culture. It might not be either of those things, but I don't know what it is. So that's how I'm labeling it for now. Yes. Then in academic deep dive, we're going to discuss the academic article, When Paid Work Invades the Family, Mercy Like a Disease, Single Mothers in a COVID-19 Pandemic. And then in good or bad advice, we are going to go back and deep dive into the wonderful world of TikTok. So there are going to be a lot of videos for this one. So you might want to also check out our YouTube page for that. Speaking of advice, if you have any advice you'd like us to talk about, send it to us. You can email us at attachpodcast at gmail.com. Tweet us, Facebook us, Instagram us at attachpodcast. Go to attachpodcast.com and send us a message. Also, As I just referenced, we are now on YouTube, so please smash that YouTube subscribe button and follow us there, along with all of your wonderful podcast apps that you're listening to us on right now. But before we get to all of that, how's everybody doing? So I think last time we recorded, I talked about how great Keenan was sleeping. (laughs) I jinxed it. I jinxed it. I think it was like... Two days later, I don't believe in demon possession, but I might now. (laughs) It was bad. Like, honestly, I have never, like, he literally would not, like, he fell asleep at like seven o'clock and woke up an hour later and between eight and 3 a.m. He slept for 30 minutes, maybe, maybe maybe 45. The craziest thing was, so like Chelsea and I are just like trying everything, walking around, bouncing him, like feeding him, trying to do everything. And so finally at 2.30, like, let's just get him in a bath again. Sure. Yeah. We get him in a bath. He starts smiling and kicking, starts rubbing his eyes. We get him out. He passes out. Um, He's like, I just need you guys to reset my bedtime routine, please. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And- (gasps) And as you can hear, he's he's with me again today. So he's chiming in and say, yeah, that's what I needed, Dad. I just need to do math. But, so I think I learned my lesson. I am not going to brag about my child's sleeping patterns sure. on the podcast because it's going to come back to bite me. Oh, but it is good to celebrate the things that you feel proud of as a parent. Yeah, well, I mean, like... But also realize that you really have no control. No, over it wasn't you. It wasn't you. Something. You didn't achieve that. To do <laughs> you put it into the universe like you did achieve it. The universe is like, oh, that's so cute. The universe was like, <laughs> precious. Yeah, I was in meetings with students that day. I'm like, okay, I just got to drink more coffee because I have to stay awake. And hopefully what oh I'm gosh. saying to you as I'm trying to guide you in your research trajectory is making any sense. (laughs) Oh, we'll see. Hopefully a good thing I meet with them like on a weekly and biweekly basis so I can change anything that I told them wrong that day. So other than that, you know, being tired and being in what is now an Iowa winter, we're doing fine. Nice. Iowa winter. Surely they have a song about Iowa winters and about how, you know, lovely they are. It's more like, do you all ever watch, why can't I think about the name of the song? The Bing Crosby, it's the famous Christmas show, White Christmas. White Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Snow, 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 snow. 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 Ooh. (laughs) Those feel like, those feel like the right notes. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Definitely. Uh, The question was, do I ever watch that? Yes. Every yes. Christmas. hundred percent. Many, totally. probably many times. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It. Yeah. Actually, quick side note about that. 
I had never seen it until Chelsea and I were together because they watched that every Christmas Eve and I'd never seen it. So the last four years I've seen it. So it's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Same with my husband. He always watches Christmas vacation with his yes. family. Also mine. And then mm-hmm. my family was white Christmas. Yes. So you can imagine too. really yes. <laughs> that combo. It's very, very fascinating to see how the other side live. <laughs> But the thing is, they reference White Christmas in Christmas Vacation. So there is a crossover. It's the circle of life. Yes, it is the circle of life. What what about you? I'm doing so well. I'm doing so great. It's honestly, I feel like this segment is the most challenging for me to come up with something to talk about. Because I am in surviving pandemic mode, full-time employment, parent of a six-year-old, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So like, all, so like, I don't, I mean, if I had hobbies before, which we all know I didn't, they'd be gone now anyways. So what have I been doing recently? I've been playing a lot of dolls with my child. Yeah, American Girl doll. A catalog came for Christmas and that inspired her to play with my doll that I have from childhood Aww. and a doll that- I got free in the neighborhood (laughs) during this pandemic. Somebody listed their like older child's American Girl dolls for free. And I was Uh like, oh, hey, we'll take one. And so that's what we've been doing. I have been in a weird, very, (laughs) I don't know why I'm recording this, let alone like sharing it. (laughs) But (laughs) a weird Google deep dive of like looking for Oh, what were like the dresses that this doll wore (laughs) and (laughs) looking for like old books and catalogs. And you would not believe the shit that they have on eBay for American Girl dolls. I now know my doll is missing one boot. And did I find one boot for sale on eBay? I sure did. (laughs) I actually accused my mom of maybe being the person selling the other boot. (laughs) Obviously (laughs) you retained it and now you're trying to make money. Yeah, it's like, this stuff's worth a lot. So that's what I've been up to, really. That's awesome. Yeah, super American fun. Girl, I, don't even know even even I mean, <laughs> I don't know if this is a popular opinion, but American Girl dolls kind of creep me out. It's not popular. That's unpopular opinion. <laughs> I don't know why you would even say that. <laughs> not a popular opinion. <laughs> How dare you say that? Like, I don't know. Um, like, my pop culture references are always someone, old. <laughs> I know, I just like, sometimes I just like, I don't know. Maybe I've seen too many horror films where the dolls come oh, to damn. life. But yeah, don't watch those. That's not right. I don't watch those. <laughs> these are like these are dolls based in historical fiction. My child, at the age of six, learned about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Totally age appropriate. Thank you, free doll from the neighborhood whose books we didn't get. It's totally a great learning experience. Oh yeah. Oh. So I was right to be a little bit freaked out, not because nope. of what I nope. was saying, but because of how they're traumatizing children with these. Well, they're probably not traumatizing the age group they're actually targeted for. It's just that I was like, well, let's read about this. And was like, oh, shit. It's like real, it's real. <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Speaking of hobbies, I think I've talked about on this podcast how through the pandemic, all of the hobbies I typically have don't food, sewing and the like no longer mm. bring me joy. Don't know why. Yeah. Some people may say that's a symptom of depression. Sure. There's nothing. Join Doll do. World. Just join Doll World. <laughs> yeah. Nothing called Doll depressed World. There. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, combating that, I actually took up a project that I've been meaning to do for a while, which is finish sewing these floor pillows for my children's reading nook area. Because I don't know if you guys have ever priced out giant floor pillows, but they are expensive. So about seven, eight months ago when this whole pandemic started, nine months, 10 months, 12, I, I've lost count. I went to Joanne Fabrics, all the stuff for floor pillows coming in far cheaper, of course, than the price would actually be. And I made one of them. And then nine months later, this weekend, I finally got around. Yay! Finishing the other one. There is a thir- third one that I still haven't finished. So maybe in another year, I will finish the, <laughs> the third giant floor pillow. And then the reading nook will be complete, at least with floor pillows. But that felt fun and good. And like, 
nice. accomplished something. So that's nice. Fantastic. As a working mom, who would you say is using that reading nook the most, your child or someone else in your family? <laughs> that's an excellent question. Typically, I am uh, told to sit <laughs> in the reading nook while my child, to do my work while my child is <laughs> online schooling because I'm not allowed in any other part of the house while she's doing online schooling. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm usually cramped up in the, so maybe that's another reason why I really was motivated to do. These Good for you. you. Good for you. Bottom started hurting while sitting right. there for eight hours a day. Yeah. Whatever. For my children, for me, tomato, tomato, right? I think it's even better if you did it for yourself. Nice Fantastic. work. Hashtag well, self-care. First up, pop in culture. <laughs> We learn about relationships from our friends and families, but a lot of what we think about love and relationships come from what we see in pop culture. For this first segment, we take a moment to highlight events in pop culture that influence people's lives and how we view relationships. Jacob, tell us, what do you have for us this week? So jumping off the hashtag self-care, I want to talk about this individualistic and often privileged view we have of self-care so Mm -hmm. there's a new show on netflix called the cabin with a comedian right and he has decided that throughout his life he has been like unhealthy and all this kind of stuff you know he's trying to connect with who he is in an individual so of course he rents this really luxurious cabin in the hollywood hills invites some of his comedic friends and they do crazy stuff like you know, like have people come do energy readings on them and like acupuncture and like oh, also like skinning and grilling an emu. So, you know, like lots of really normal, normative? Yeah, normal, like, and, and I kind of thought of this as kind of like a dude's version of Eat, Pray, Love. Did y'all see that oh. movie with, you know, Julia Roberts a long time ago? Sarah, is that a yes or a no? I can't tell. It's a no. It's a no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's this notion that for an or, for in order to find yourself, you must mm-hmm. remove yourself uh. from the people you are closest to. Mm. Now, I'm all about having the space to be on your own like I think some time as an individual which is really hard to get in this pandemic like to be on your own to not have other people around can be healthy right I think it can be healthy to you know have things that you like to do that are disconnected you know maybe hobbies like American Girl dolls or whatever it might be like sewing giant pillows you know like that sounded condescending that's not condescending I don't want to remove myself from the people that I love. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Wait, are you saying that you love me or that you don't love me? I, I kind of really interpret that. Go on. <laughs> but so it's like this idea because throughout this show, this comedian like will like Skype in his wife and like talk to her while he's high. And she'll be like, are you taking care of yourself? I can't believe you're doing this. You should be doing blah, blah, blah. Are you getting healthier? I just think that this narrative that in order to be a whole person, we must Mm. leave everybody we know and love behind, maybe bring along a few great friends and have an adventure where we connect with ourselves. I think there's important identity exploration that happens that can happen in that regard. We find ourselves in our closest relationships. If we come from this idea that the only way to know who I am is to be separate from other people, I don't think we'll really ever understand who we are. It's in those closest relationships where we learn about ourselves. And if we think that in order to be a person, we must be completely separate from people we care about, that can be a really, how do I want to say this? Like toxic view of like individuality or autonomy. Yeah. I think throughout the show, we talk about how much we need other people. And I think too, that there needs to be more of this narrative that in relationships with other people is where we find ourselves. So the cabin, I kind of gave it like two or three episodes and then they couldn't do it anymore. Keenan, as you could hear, did not totally approve either. Yeah. But I do want to just kind of like say, hey, let's not just have, this is the only narrative about how we find ourselves. Our closest relationships are where we really learn about who we are and 
find ourselves. So yeah, don't eat, pray, love just to and get out of all your close relationships because it's not necessarily going to help you find out who you are. Yeah, but at the same time, like you said at the beginning, having me time, having, you know, alone time is perfectly acceptable. Oh, 100%. I'm all about that. It's just this, this narrative that yeah. people must do something big and drastic and like break off all of their close relationships and that's how they'll find. Right. I agree. Like travel around the world, both eating, praying, and loving. I mean, none of those things sound bad, but... Right, you're not, not selling that for me. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. I don't know what that means. Six of one, half a dozen of another. I'm just going to say sayings means. now. Now we're going to move to the academic deep dive segment and finally talk about research exploring how COVID-19 is impacting families. Although there's been a huge amount of COVID research published in the last six months, very little of it has taken a look at close relationships. One very awesome exception is the article we're going to talk about in this episode titled, When Paid Work Invades the Family, Single Mothers in the COVID-19 Pandemic. This study was done by Dr. Rosanna Hertz at Wellesley College, Jane Matters at Single Mother by Choice Organization in New York City, and Alexandria Shook at Yale, and was recently published in the Journal of Family issues. The authors point out that families have been, quote, stretched to the breaking point with few childcare resources and limited school schedules. But nowhere has the stress been greater than for single moms. They specifically use the lens of production versus reproduction. In other words, that the ability for women to pursue paid employment is at odds with raising a family. And in order to work, women often need to outsource caregiving responsibilities. But now when so many of us are doing paid work from home, the worlds of production and reproduction have collapsed. And in trying to socially distance as much as possible, we've lost other sources of childcare support like grandparents and neighbors. Single moms, even in normal times, struggle to find time to work outside the home, take care of their kids, and socially connect. But now they need to function as a teacher for their children, get paid work done during the weird random hours their kids are occupied with some, something else, and possibly continue to support friends and family who need help, but all at a distance. Well, particularly the, the supporting friends and family. So while all parents are likely very stressed right now, the author suggests that single mothers are possibly living intensely stressful lives. Sarah, the authors also describe how resourceful single mothers are. What does that look like? And how do these researchers explore the effects of COVID-19 on single moms? Yes, I think what is really important in that resourceful piece is part of what the authors are highlighting as typically single moms are really strategic about creating and maintaining supportive networks of resources, social support networks that the authors use the term strategic villages. So they rely on kind of bartering and giving back and forth and this like family-based generosity process, meaning that they are relying on friends and family, but especially family to be able to be both a parent and be employed. And so part of what the authors are saying is that in, in normal times, single moms are really good because really successful juggling that production versus is reproduction dichotomy because they're able to mobilize other people and build this really important mm -hmm. social support network. So part of what they are wanting to look at in this, in this project is whether that strategic village that single moms may have had before the pandemic help to kind of lessen the effects of the pandemic on single mom's ability to be employed. They also wanted to look at whether the weight of daycare for preschool and school age kids led single moms to look for new ways to organize their households. And then okay. third, they were interested in that, whether that tension between production and reproduction was altered at all as a result of the pandemic. So some important questions that they're particularly interested in the single mom population and their sample is really kind of unique. I think that's important to remember when we're talking about this research, although I suspect many 
listeners who are parents will not hear these results and feel anything but maybe collective empathy. Their sample was recruited through a survey in June, 2020. So we're several months okay. into kind of that first wave, what we now know is a first wave. It was sent to three groups whose members already had a child without a partner or who were considering solo motherhood. And they were these specific groups, including the members of the Single Mothers by Choice organization and an affiliated Facebook group, the counseling special interest group of the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society, and a large group of single moms in Canada that I suspect maybe the second author had a connection to, or, or one of the authors had a connection to that they could recruit from. So they they sent out the survey during the month of June, and the survey focused on ways that single moms responded when workplaces, childcare facilities, and other kinds of supports like gyms or self-help groups meetings, et cetera, mm. other kind of ancillary supports shut down during what they called the height of the pandemic. So that because they were recruiting across two countries and they ended up getting a sample across the US, they okay. really wanted to language it in terms of wherever you were regionally, whatever you considered or whatever your area considered to be the height of the pandemic. But in general, their sample was responding about two and a half months after most everywhere was widely closed down. Okay. So they had survey items, but they invited participants to respond qualitatively. So they got to write in responses to help kind of tell their story. And they got a lot of really rich responses. So wow. this is a, yeah. So they got like paragraph responses from a yeah. lot of people. And that means that this descriptive study includes some, some numbers, some quantitative ways of describing what these moms are going through, but a lot of really rich qualitative data that they analyzed to kind of pick up themes for what these moms were going through. And um, what you're saying is, is a descriptive study is kind of mm -hmm. different than you know, other types of studies we've looked at before, which is more, more kind of like predictive studies, like X mm -hmm. predicts these outcomes. Descriptive studies kind of are used when we don't quite understand a phenomena. And the phenomena mm -hmm. here is the experience of, of single moms. Purpose of it is just to look and describe what's happening and, and, and going on, not like a causal yes. link to anything. Right. Yes, exactly. And they and they did so with some of these quantitative responses, but they really had so much color and richness from their qualitative Amazing. data. Yeah. So they had responses from 722 single moms. Almost 93% had at least one kid between zero and 18. The average age of child was seven and the average number of kids was 2.2. Average age of moms was 46. The majority had at least a bachelor's degree, 86% white, 88% straight, a little more than half, I think were middle or upper, upper middle class income. So again, the sample is kind of really, I think, important to think about. 606 of those moms were from the US and living across 46 states. So regionally, they captured a pretty big wow. representation of the US. 75% of their sample lived in a single adult home, whereas a quarter lived in multi-adult households. So half of those or so included like grandparents, they were multi-generational or some oh. other mix of relatives, like grown children who were staying with them and helping with childcare or, but they weren't always multi-generational. So they had caregivers, nannies, roommates, a few had some significant people they listed as significant others. And only about 8% changed their household composition due to COVID. I say oh. only 8%. It is still, it's still a, a decent number of this. Yeah. Example. And I, I mean, I personally know and am myself a person who has had to change their household composition over the course of this year to be able to have sustain either parenting or employment. Right. And life, just sustain, just sustaining life. So it's not, it's not nobody, that's for sure. So what they found were that 84% of their samples full-time employed before COVID, but Many of them had an employment change, of course, as we're familiar with, many people have had yeah. to do. So 14% in single adult homes and 19% in multi-adult homes had some sort of furlough or reduced hours. But during mm -hmm. what it meant was that during the height of the pandemic, women who lived alone with their kids were less satisfied with their work hours because they really wanted to be able to decrease them. It wasn't enough moms oh. who were able to decrease they only have only a few moms actually did this or were able to do this, even though a lot of moms wish like this just isn't this just isn't working. Almost every single person who responded said that they were really socially isolated. Yeah. 99%. Wow. That's yeah. literally 
the other people just probably missed the question. (laughs) So they described struggling to accomplish more tasks with fewer resources. So their paid work and their kids were competing for their attention. They had qualitative responses that described like meetings being chaotic, kids crying in them, running to have to like find things to appease their kids while trying to keep meetings going. They're just doing the same, the the two tasks overlapping at the same time. And it required really intensive engagement with their kids' needs while trying to do their paid employment tasks. So So can I share an anecdotal story of this recently happening? Yes. Uh, though I'm not a, a single mom, but this is still rings true for me. So I was doing Zoom interviews. I'm on the hiring committee for my college and I was doing Zoom interviews with candidates and I didn't realize that my mic had become unmuted and I was trying to get my oldest ready for her piano lessons that are also on Zoom. And so I was snapping my fingers. I'm like, hey, hey, go get your piano books, go get them. And then I, the meeting stopped and I looked, and I was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was just yelling at my kid in the middle of your interview. <laughs> Remute. <laughs> I have no idea how it happened, but I feel this like chaos. Yeah. Uh, that chaos. a lot. Right. Part of what they described in this paper was that workplaces are continuing to expect, at least for the sample, mm-hmm. the same levels of work involvement and productivity. And not I mean, that's unlike, my experience. Yep. Not unlike pre-pandemic times, they are essentially are expecting that working moms they have no family obligations. They divide in the workplace this other role or part of their life that like this is not, so they have the same expectations and somehow having to meet it with just utter chaos. They described that 58% of women in single adult homes were feeling like their work productivity declined. I honestly am surprised it's only that many compared to 47% in multi-adult homes. This was also June. So we are now in December. I don't know what that looks like now. That's several, that's six more months. That's, but they're feeling constantly distracted all day. There is this theme of absence of boundaries that impedes productivity more so for single adult homes. And on top of that, they talked about moms being worried about future employment and being judged in comparison to their colleagues who don't have the same constraints. So they're either working, they're either feeling like work is a lot less important than taking care of their kids because they're in the middle of a pandemic. So it's incredibly hard to focus on work, but they had to keep doing it because they couldn't lose their job or trying to ask for help at work, but being really fearful that that made them seem really weak or ineffective compared to colleagues who either weren't voicing it or didn't have the same constraints. So it's just constant interruptions and then feeling a lack of motivation and then feelings of futility, just not being able to get done what they want to. In terms of losing daycare, that impacted moms in single adult homes more because they were unable to continue previous childcare plans, Right, relied on these groups that were closed. They described feeling, one participant described feeling like incredibly drained to have a toddler around 24 seven with no chance for a break. And it's just relentless. On top of that, where the authors had described these strategic villages being in place beforehand, now there's this fear of spreading the virus. So people had stopped relying on family as much in general, but the authors describe this migration away from relying on family occasionally and either relying on them like daily to help because there's no other way to do it or not at all. So these strategic villages that were really important before COVID essentially were only partially successful in adapting to this pandemic. It just was not feasible. So feeling like they had no time to recover, no time or space away from their kids, no no more energy. They don't feel like they're a good parent or a good employee. Right. And without being able to connect with other people, there's that lack of social buffer that meant that they were spending all of their time with their kids. And it's really intense way to spend life and not what they had planned for when they were thinking about having children. On top of that, feeling really poorly prepared to take on a role as like a full-time teacher. And it just really increased their feelings of isolation and intensified their stress and their identities that were at odds. So their well-being was going downhill because it typically relied on compartmentalizing my home life yeah. versus my work life. Production and reproduction were supposed to be separate. And now with no personal time and all of those in the same space, they were losing patience and feeling really both absent and present. So I think it is, again, a really unique sample in terms of moms who were intentionally raising kids without partners. And I think Mm. socioeconomically important to think about, they were middle and upper middle class. But I think if this is what moms with 
potentially more socioeconomic resources are feeling yeah. like. I don't know what this looks like in lower wage single adult homes. I I think personally, I think this level of stress is not sustainable. And no. I think it'll be really interesting to, from a research perspective, thinking about how COVID is shifting how families operate and how much of that will be permanent. I don't, I don't know what that'll look like. And, and in the months since June, again, I'm not sure how much of this has, has changed. I suspect with school starting back up in some ways, some families may have gotten some childcare relief. Oh yeah. And if, if they're child is going to school and not doing if their child is going to school if it's full-time school and then that's not factoring in the stress of it's going to school during a pandemic and kids getting sent home when they're exposed to positive and not having other kinds of child care if if my child only went to the prescribed school hours and didn't have the before care and after care that I relied on before I it still wouldn't be enough it still wouldn't work for me so my child's just home full-time and I mean I resonate a lot with what has been described here. And I just think we are at, when they describe a breaking point, I am just worried about we're expecting families, but especially moms to be so adaptable and flexible past what humans are capable of being. So there's some measure of resilience and resourcefulness here. And also are we finding that we're just crushing, Mm -hmm. we're just crushing families through this process and without building meaningful social support structures or shifting how employers support moms, we're just expecting moms to be the social safety net for right. families. Right. It's hard for me to process all of this because I am so emotionally reactive to all of this yeah. and because it, it touches me in such a, a real way. But I agree with you. It, it, it certainly isn't sustainable. And unfortunately, I see no solution. Like I can't so often in these takeaways, it's like, but you know, there's hope or, but you know, here's something that you can, you can do, but it's so hard to think of a solution that isn't systemic, right. To some broad reaching across everybody, some to, to help all of these people. But at the same time, it is somewhat comforting to know that you're not alone. This is not unique to, it it certainly is more exacerbated for single moms, but you know, it's not unique to parents generally, I think in this, particularly parents with young, young children, young children, during this high period. Yeah. Well, and I think one piece about the employers and our social policy, our, our state and federal policy and how we support parents is that employers aren't compensating, at least in this project for the added burdens that these families are experiencing, but they're also not making these parents visible. They're not validating these parents. They're not talking about or highlighting what these parents are experiencing so that these parents end up feeling totally unseen. They're not heard. They're not seen. They're supposed to keep it quiet while their kids running into Zoom meetings without clothes on, right? And they're supposed to be feeding their child while participating in a meeting they're supposed to be leading. I mean, this isn't this isn't real. When on top of that, your employer does not name that like, this is impossible. Are there ways we can help? Are there ways we can be flexible? Because the other piece is, I think there is other research that that focuses on how boosting well-being actually boosts productivity, Yeah. right? So if you're actually an employer caring about your employee, your employee's sustainability and your employee's productivity, then you should also be prioritizing their well-being. And if you do that first and put that first and be creative in kind of policy initiatives and procedures about how you make these parents visible and are intentional in supporting them, it's possible that that then everybody wins as at least as much as a, as people can win right now. I agree, but like you said as well, there's no short-term incentives for employers to do that, right? What you're talking about is well-being and is a long-term incentive because in the long term, then people are more productive. But in the short term, there's no incentive for employers, unfortunately, to to do that. I I think of like my own job and how they they say that there are efforts to kind of do this simply by extending 10-year timeline. But that's out of one side of the mouth. But at the same time, I'm being told to do more to Mm -hmm. that, you know, what I'm doing right now isn't isn't quite good enough and that I need to Mm -hmm. do X, Y, and Z additionally to what I'm already doing. So there's this weird, and this is very specific to academia, but I think it's throughout, is 
you know, will will give you some leeway by extending your tenure timeline, but also what you're doing right now isn't good enough and you need to do more. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, so you're trying, or some people, this university are trying to acknowledge this, but at the same time, the expectations continue to increase. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it results in a not very meaningful, helpful strategy. And, and it feels like being gaslit in some ways. I'm supposed to yeah. believe you care about me, but quite obviously it doesn't feel very it, supportive. In reading this piece, and I, I've really been eager for research on fa- on family and, and close relationships in the context of COVID to come out, or I have several preprint papers that I feel like I have my eye on to see how they kind of evolve. And I'm really hopeful about bringing them onto the podcast to kind of share this really new cutting edge science. But I think this paper, I I also had a lot of emotional reaction to reading it. And so I'm not sure that the authors are saying that they have suggestions. I'm not sure that's their goal, right, right? For what to do about it. But I think in sharing it, I'm hopeful that listeners will feel heard and validated in ways that maybe they're not getting elsewhere. And understand that at least, at least I, at least I think this isn't sustainable. This isn't how anyone set goals for parenting and working at the same time, especially single parents. I mean, they've made that really clear throughout this paper. I think this will have to be addressed and I really hope it's addressed sooner rather than later. But if there's opportunities to advocate in your own employment system for parents, especially if you have more of a position of power, yeah. I hope that those listeners will take the opportunity to do that. Woohoo! Boo! Woohoo! Yeah! Finally, time for good or bad advice, where we talk about pervasive relationship advice in our culture. We hear relationship advice from our parents, our friends, and our families. We see advice about how to be in relationships from movies and TV shows. And we read endless advice spewed at us on all of the social medias, blogs, and all those numerous top 10 lists. But a lot of it just actually isn't good for our relationships. This is the part of the show where we use science, mind you, to decide if the advice is good or bad. If you have seen or heard any advice you'd like us to talk about it, send it to us. Email us at attachedpodcast at gmail.com or tweet us. Facebook us, Instagram us at Attached Podcast, or go straight to our website, attachedpodcast.com, and send us a message. While you're at it, as always, please like and subscribe to our podcast, either on your favorite podcast app or YouTube. So today, you guys know my newfound love for TikTok that I have discovered during the pandemic. So we are going to do a final for the last episode of this year an epic TikTok deep dive. Are you guys excited? Yes. So excited. So this first one is from number one dad. Self-appointed. Self-appointed. I've done a TikTok from number one dad before talking about giving tree. And this one is about the rainbow fish. Another oh, story. Time. I hate that story. And Kierkegaard said that uh, envy was the predisposition for leveling. You know, this evening out in society where everybody is going to be the same, uh, this pressure to conform. uh, And that's exactly what happens to this fish. Have you read this book? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he brings down the wrath. He brings down the envy of the fish around him just by virtue of his appearance. And uh, as a result of that, they shun him. uh, He's a little confused and he doesn't know what to do. So he goes and seeks counsel with this octopus. And what does the octopus tell him to do? That the only way he's going to find happiness is if he gives up those parts of himself that make him different. Um, and uh, Initially, he refuses. And that's probably the last point in the book where he is healthy. Uh, healthy in a new chain sense, I think. But uh, honestly, if there was like an aquatic review board, this octopus's license should have been revoked. So the rest of that story goes, the, the fish then gives his beautiful, shiny scales to all of the other fish, and then everybody has a beautiful, shiny scale. So good or bad advice. You can either talk about the book or number one dad's per- perspective, whatever you think. I want to talk about number one dad. I think he is number one dad. This is the second time in a row I am all on board, yeah. right? 
If yeah. somebody is asking you to give up all of the parts of their self that make you unique and different so other people can feel good, yeah, not healthy. That octopus should definitely have their license revoked. And number one, dad at it again with like dismantling really negative messages we teach children in books. So I think that that, as I wrap that around my mind, that's good advice from number one dad, bad advice from Rainbow Fish book. Right. So number one dad, thumbs up good advice woods yeah i agree very good advice i feel very validated too because he's i mean i hate this book and somebody gifted it to my daughter a few years ago and i don't think i had it as a kid and so i read it and was like oh my this is what an awful message because i i waited for like the next where's the next page where all of them realize they've been selfish and horrible and they've treated this fish so poorly and they give the fish back these scales that are his i mean he's literally taking off his body parts (laughs) to give away so awful so i agree with jacob it's yes it is a lot like the given tree yeah giving away all of those parts of yourself that make you you and make you happy is incredibly unhealthy and if people are asking you to do that that's an important boundary to set Uh, so good advice all the way around i am i remember these two books because as a 4-H camp counselor, which I was for many, many, many years, about six I or seven years. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I thought my first career, I thought I was going to go into cooperative extension and do camps. I loved it. But these are two books we read over and over and over to the kids. And it was part tradition. Like we just, these are books, especially The Giving Tree that had been around for years. And so it was just part of the tradition that you read it. As part of Vespers, it was one of the songs, not songs, but it was one of the books that you continuously read. And it's just remarkable. I have no idea why we continue to read and what message we sent to hundreds and thousands of of Georgia foragers. So sorry about that, (laughs) (laughs) y'all. Next one is from Stolamashi talking about how to fight with your husband. So the other day, my husband got mad at me because I was on my phone a lot and then he brought it up. And then it made me want to bring up all of his shortcomings, but I didn't because that's not what we're talking about. So now I have to choose a time next week to organically bring up his faults. I'm thinking maybe Wednesday, right before he goes to bed. So good or bad advice? I think that this idea that you need to focus on one topic can be useful, right? Like if you're going to, you know, if there's one topic that you're going to focus on that you need to discuss, that's important and you should talk about that. What I think is bad advice (laughs) is this, this storing up of like, okay, when can I mess with my partner the most that'll make them like most uncomfortable to bring up everything that's wrong with them? I think she's doing that partially in jest, which I appreciate that. I I think that there is some flexibility on this too, right? Like a lot of times you'll hear this idea, like only focus on one topic at a time. And unfortunately, as humans in relationships, we're not very good at that. But I think it's good to try to kind of limit the number of topics that are coming into a conversation, unless they're connected in terms of like how you talk about them or how you argue about them. And that might be a good way to point out, we'll see... I felt this way when you do this and you feel this way when I do that. And we need to kind of work on the process that's going on behind this, not necessarily the issues that we're talking about. So overall, I would say bad advice, but that's just because of like all of the convolutedness in that. So bad advice about like trying to organically bring up yeah. all of his faults. <laughs> at yeah. an time. Right. Uh, okay. not, not bad. It's good advice to like try to stay on topic, but often really, really hard. Okay. Woods. <laughs> I think bad advice because I also don't think that's her best way to refute his complaint. <laughs> I mean, it's really very, it feels like planned revenge, which I appreciate the amount of self-control <laughs> it would take to hold on to all of that and just hold it until next week. But I, I really think that the the piece about you're on your phone too much is a common issue now in couples that probably requires a little bit more of a deep dive to process why that's a concern and and whether I want to make any changes in my own behavior to kind of meet that issue. So bad advice, but obviously we realize she's Adorable. being hilarious. She's being sarcastic. At least we it. hope. I mean, if she's not being sarcastic, she's doing it in a very funny way. 
Next, we have Man from Somewhere talking about forgiveness. Hey, forgiveness is hard because the hurt mattered. Did you know that? However, forgiving someone doesn't mean you trust them. It means you are no longer depending on them to right the wrong. You are releasing them from owning you. Good or bad advice from Man from Somewhere. I love Man from Somewhere's accent, by the way. I want to contextualize this a little bit okay? because I think he said in there that forgiving someone means that you doesn't mean that you trust them. And I think that there's a difference between like little forgivenesses and big forgivenesses. If I can say them a little bit, a little bit different, okay, right? Yeah. In relationships, we're going to mess up all the time and hopefully not in fundamental ways that betray the foundational trust of our relationship. Right. And when we do that, I think it's okay to forgive somebody and still trust them. But there might be times, and I think this is what he's talking about, where the betrayal of trust is so deep that um, the foundation of the relationship is broken, potentially where it can't be prepared or you don't want to, or you need to move forward without that person in your life. Yeah. And so if that's the case, that's when forgiveness doesn't mean you have to trust them. It's about letting go of that emotional mm burden or connection or attachment that you have and being able to move forward. So for the little, you know, things that you do to let your partner down that like hurt them and you apologize and they can use to kind of, all right, I'm not going to do that in the, in the future. And that strengthens that trust. I, I think that's how we should look about that. But if there are these bigger, more toxic, more foundational issues that somebody has gone to hurt you and you find it to forgive them, it is about you don't have to trust them. You don't have to necessarily bring them back into your life. Overall, I think this is good advice just with that caveat. Okay, good advice. But also, as always, remember context. Woods, what do you think? Good or bad advice? I think bad advice. I think it's trying really hard to give advice that is actually really hard to understand. I don't think people understand how to remotely do that in that 60 second description of forgiveness. And I think I agree with what Jacob's saying about you can forgive people and not invite them back into your life in ways that are really big or meaningful and that set boundaries, but still kind of acknowledge and understand the limitations that those people were under when they did something that that hurt you, for example. I also think it's describing forgiveness from a really individual perspective. Yeah. And his first point about forgiveness is hard because the hurt mattered. It feels to me like he moves on to, so therefore like forgive and move on so that they don't own you. But we didn't do anything with the hurt. And I'm not sure forgiveness is that meaningful or that possible without addressing the hurt and the pain. And that's true whether or not it's kind of individual unilateral forgiveness or a process that maybe a dyad or a family goes through. But I think there's probably more to it in terms of deeper forgiveness happens when I talk about how much it was that you hurt me and you acknowledge, understand how much it was that you hurt me in order for that to feel just more powerful, I think, and more intentional. Yeah. So it, how important it is to acknowledge and process through that hurt. We can't just say like, yeah. oh, I, I'm hurt and, okay. and therefore move. I release you. I release you. don't you. own me. Right. So. I declare bankruptcy. Yes. <laughs> I declare forgiveness. <laughs> right. Then poof, all your hurt is gone. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a really good point that it is, it is a much more of a process than what he alluded to in terms of trying to heal that hurt. So from both of you, some people, some potentially some good and some bad advice there. Okay, moving on next uh, from Yo Lin Dadong. I could be saying that completely wrong, which is plausible and both possible. Can you do a tutorial on how to get a boy's attention? Yeah, sure, why not? Because I'm a love doctor or something. Well, what you have to do is do absolutely nothing and then focus on yourself And that's when a boy will come along and notice and think to themselves, wow, she's so happy. Let me ruin her life. So the question, (laughs) so someone asked her a question, can you do a tutorial on how to get a boy's attention? She's very, very funny. I recommend following her. So good or bad advice? I mean, this is bad advice. And I think she's doing that intentionally, (laughs) right? I am all about focusing on yourself. If you want to find a, you know, like just in generally, whether you want to find a partner or not. And I'm also don't think it's good advice that you just do nothing, right? 
you know, that type of relationship where, you know, you're just passive and you just wait for the boy to come along and ruin your life, as he's talking about in this context, is a very dated notion that I think still kind of is encapsulating women in this passivity of like, oh, just be pretty and beautiful and do everything you need to look pretty and beautiful. And then this boy will come along, right? Which I think she's playing on because then she says, will ruin your life. So, I mean, I think the facetiousness, the sarcasm is really good advice. Like, what what are you doing? Like, why are we asking this? You know what? Like, relationships are complicated and difficult to build and maintain, and they take a lot of investment. Maybe she's not saying that. But, you know, just this idea that she is undermining by being sarcastic, I think is good advice. So with sarcasm, good advice. Without sarcasm, bad advice. (laughs) Okay. Woods, good or bad advice? I think it is bad advice. I think that it is advice we repeatedly give young women. Mm -hmm. It is advice I received many times as a young woman, which is funny when I think about it because I partnered with my now husband at the age of 17. (laughs) So why was I being given this advice so frequently at such a (laughs) middle school? I'm pretty sure that's what that means. But I think we do do that. And I think really what the advice could be recouched as for young girls is it isn't about focusing on yourself in order to attract act a partner. Yes. It's about focusing on yourself because you matter and have worth and you're totally a whole person without a partner. Yes. And the partner piece has nothing to do with that. That is totally different and not how I would even recommend trying to attract a partner in the first place. So I really want to kind of divide and carve out that piece because it really makes young girls, young women's self-worth contingent on attracting a mate Mm -hmm. Um, right which is like the basis of like cinderella and sleeping beauty and snow white and all of all of those uh, disney classics so next we have the ashley mayfield don't waste words on people that deserve your silence sometimes the most powerful thing you can say is nothing at all good or bad advice from ashley Don't waste words on people who deserve your silence. So yeah, there are some people that you don't need to give your time to who are angry or like who may be just like trolls or mean or, and if there's a possibility to step away from that, not in every context there is, great, right? But if we're talking about this in the context of close relationships, I worry about taking this advice of, well, I'm just not going to bring up what I have to say to you because you are not worth my time, that is going to undermine your closest and most important relationships. There's a way and a time to bring up important conversations of, you know, maybe just arguing for arguing's sake and doing it over and over and over and over again is going to be pretty toxic. Finding a way to take a step back and approach the conversation differently either with the support of a therapist or or just in your own kind of learning and thinking about it, I think is smart. But like just taking the tactic of like, you're not worth my time, you're not worth my words. In a close relationship that's important to you is bad advice because if you want that relationship to continue, it's going to need those emotions, those feelings, those conversations to be had in ways that can bring you closer together if that is the end goal for your relationship. So in that context... I say bad advice. So good advice or bad advice, depending on context. I'm all about the context. Yeah. I mean, it's I think it's word. your new, fence. it's like season yeah. two fence. fence. I think yeah. it's the way to, to make it so like, because I don't know if you notice this, but like every once in a while, as I'm giving good or bad advice, like I look to see Sarah's face. And I'm like, <laughs> what is she thinking? What is she thinking? <laughs> Is she going to totally, am I missing something that she's going to come and make me look really stupid? That's oh my, my goodness. <laughs> wow. I'm so worried about Sarah. I love my that. brilliance is intimidating. <laughs> that makes has. sense. It that makes has. sense. Woods, good or bad yeah. advice? <laughs> I think bad advice. I think this is the kind of like really pop culture advice that made us want to add this segment into the podcast. Advice given really directly, like it's really emphatic and really important for people to take on. And you see this kind of mantra repeated and repeated and repeated. And I think it is unhelpful. It doesn't tell anyone what to actually do. And I think it's promoting some kind of really toxic, intense cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, those people who will ascribe to that are not necessarily the people who are also flexible in thinking about what 
Like, are there messages I need to hear? Are there things I could learn from this? And the flip side, are there ways that I could kind of advocate for myself or set a boundary in a way that's not so emotionally reactive, but still creates some distance and protects myself and my family, for example. So yeah, it's really bad and unhelpful. Right. Cause silence, just a stonewalling silence is an emotional cutoff. You're not dealing with any of those emotions. It's part of a toxic relationship is, is that silence also called stonewalling by John Gottman and others. I'm sure he takes credit for all of it. So bad advice. I don't know why I just threw John Gottman under the bus, but whatever. These last two are specifically with Jacob in mind. I still, of course, want Woods' thoughts and feedback. Sure. Um, So this first one is about a mother of a groom-to-be and the bride. It's not going to match anything that we have going on in our wedding. Well, you're going to wear a white wedding dress. Yeah, so our our girls are going to be beige. Yeah, but he's walking with me, and I could get a dress that matches that. Yeah. He is not listening to his fiance. They both have no regard for what she's saying. And I feel bad for the girl. She's just like in the background, just like, hey, I'm here. So if you're looking at all of these, which is your absolute favorite right now? So I definitely do love this blue that he's going to try on. It looks old. Really? Yes. Uh -uh. It's kind of a sleeper. Just keep in mind, your wedding pictures, if he's wearing red and everyone else is wearing a different color, it might not look right. I'm not really caring that much about those. I'm thinking you're going to be in white that's going to match anything and if i'm going to be the same color as jason that's going to match do you hear her she's crazy she thinks she's the bride so just to recap because it's a video and there are a lot of expressions going on the mother-in-law to be wants to wear the same color as her son but that is not going to match anything else in the bridal party and the (gasps) mother-in-law gives two shits. I don't know if this is like a good or bad advice, but maybe it's a a example of how to be in relationships. And is that good or bad? I don't know if you heard my little dude squeal during that, but that is because I was feeling that intensity of like, oh no, as you can hear him now, that's pretty bad advice (laughs) in that if there is that much of a triangle between a mother and a son in that there is not enough room for the bride of the wedding to have an opinion or that her ideas matter, that is something that needs to be addressed early and often. Or maybe you should ought to rethink that wedding because the sustainability of that relationship, I worry about, right? If this woman, this bride's voice isn't allowed to be heard this early on in the relationship, that is a pattern that is likely continue to continue across time. So if I were this, if I was this bride's friend, or I'm guessing that was the uh, person who, the woman talking was the person who's selling the dress, who's noticing this pattern and saying like- It might be a a wedding planner. This was TLC. So I think it was one of those reality shows. And that's why I thought of you because it was a reality show. Oh, I love watching like, what's that? The like, (laughs) say yes to the dress. Fan of that show because you do see these strong family dynamics come out, right? So if- that woman is seeing this pattern of the bride's voice doesn't matter in this relationship. And if there's not going to be a boundary between the groom and his mom, that type of relationship is likely to become stabilized where the bride will be more further and further removed from the emotional connection that mom and son have. And that type of triangle over time will become really toxic and unsustainable. So good advice from the wedding planner. Yeah. Bad advice from mom and groom. Woods? Yeah, I agree. Bad advice from that wedding planner tuxedo saleswoman because her reflection was that this mother-in-law to be is crazy. And what I think is really interesting is that she doesn't comment on the groom's total lack of boundaries. Yeah. And so in that clip, the groom is entirely let off the hook for setting a boundary with his mother that protects his relationship with his bride. And the bride is almost entirely silent in that video clip because she is literally almost speechless. So I think it's bad advice because nothing about that mother-in-law may ever change. However, 
in order to have a healthy relationship with his partner, that groom is going to need to find some ways to differentiate a bit. <gasps> like, <laughs> I feel like I need an alarm to go off. <laughs> She used the term differentiate. I did. Well, you said it was for Jacob. So I just am tailoring my my reaction specifically to that audience. But I think he's got to find some boundaries and and figure out how to form a family with his wife if he wants that to be successful. Right. Because it clearly benefits the husband or the husband to be right. Because he wanted that red tux and just being completely silent benefits him the entire time because he gets what he wants, but he doesn't Real have to. short-term gain, right? Well, short-term <laughs> gain. You won't have those wedding pictures around your house yeah. for very much longer. <laughs> it was not a nice looking tux for that. That's for okay. <laughs> uh, it was not a nice looking tux. That's for sure. Good fashion advice. I like it. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Okay, <laughs> this is the last one. And think about all of the relationships we have. And some of them are not necessarily with humans, right? Some of us have really, really close enmeshed relationships with our cats. So that's where I'm going with this this one. This is by at N-O-E-T-Y-R-A. Okay, so take a hoodie and put on backwards and then put your cat in it. This is the easiest one of all time. Ask me the question. So, so basically you put a hoodie on, you turn it on backwards and the pocket and you put the cat into it. And then you can just have your cat there while you're doing all your work. So is this good or bad advice? Good advice. I don't even need to add anything to that. This is a hundred percent good advice. But the question is, Jacob, do you have a hoodie with five hoods in it for all your cats simultaneously? Well, no, because I all, I have an individual relationship with each one of my cats mm-hmm. and I spend individual time with them to build that one. <laughs> yeah, one. yeah. Then, so they all know, well, sometimes Albert needs to be in the hood and sometimes Louie needs to be in the hood. And they take, <laughs> oh, no. we have built a dynamic, a healthy functioning dynamic mm. in our cat filled home. <laughs> mm. Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so good advice. Woods, good or bad advice? <laughs> I think you're setting up Woods to throw shade. I think yeah, you, this wasn't, Pat- Patricia was starting throwing the shade, but I see this triangle. I see this triangle. No, no I support your individual relationships with your cat zoo. I am just, it you feels like, uns- throw that shade, throw it, throw it. it. It feels like maybe there is a problematic enmeshment there if you literally can't move around your house because we, we do a lot of podcast recordings and Jacob's cats make an appearance in every single one. So I don't know why he would need a hood to get them any closer (laughs) because they're already right between him and his work all the time. So, I mean, I think it's good advice if you wanted to keep your cat warm because you live in Iowa and (laughs) winter is sad. It's okay, Jacob. We had to turn the air conditioning on yesterday. Don't be jealous. Okay, I see how it is. More shade, show it. Bring it. Bring the shade. Maybe if it's in his hood, he can just, it's closer for that slow blinking effect where he just can make it <laughs> less feral in your pouch. <laughs> oh, mercy. We love you, Jacob. So overall, cat hoodie, good or bad advice. Jacob, please report back once you've tried it. Yeah, pictures, please. Uh, pictures. Oh, I will. Don't worry, I will. Fantastic. So thank you all for listening. This is the last episode of 2020, the worst year, hopefully, of this decade to come. Our next episode will drop January 19th, 2021. So have a very safe and wonderful holiday and new year with your loved ones. As always, remember, call us, email us, or get at us on the social media about any relationship advice you've received that you're wondering whether to follow or pass on. We cannot wait to